Is Pakistan heading towards a crisis? Pakistan, an Islamic nation in South Asia, has been going through a turbulent period for the past couple of decades, and in 2022, things seem to be coming to a head, and reaching a level of serious crisis. Despite having experienced several upheavals and difficulties in its history, Pakistan's current troubles are very different, and the worst it has ever seen. The problems Pakistan face, are found in every measurable aspect, economic, political, geostrategic, systemic, and even in their ability to provide essentials like fuel, food, and electricity, to their population. The question that pops in everyone's mind is, is Pakistan heading towards a crisis? We'll analyze how bad the situation of Pakistan is, the possible opportunities for Pakistan to overcome its problems, and lastly, if it does head into a crisis, what it would mean to the people of Pakistan, and the world at large. Pakistan is not any tiny nation, but a country with a huge population of 220 million, buffered between India and Afghanistan, with nuclear arsenal in its kitty. Pakistan has been an independent country, since 1947, formed after a bloody partition from India, founded on religious grounds, as an Islamic nation. On the foreign policy, since its independence, Pakistan has been closer to the United States and Britain, and other Western nations, and has followed a liberal policy on trade, economics, and religion, until 1977. Being an Islamic nation, Pakistan has had considerable influence with other Islamic countries, and has been particularly close to Saudi Arabia. After their tilt towards Islamization and fundamentalism, under the brutal military dictator, Zia ul Haq, who ruled for more than a decade, between 1977 and 1988, Pakistan had seen a lot of internal changes. These changes within Pakistan had created a conflict between the liberal elites of Pakistan, who had a fondness for the Western lifestyle, and a growing section of the Islamists, who had turned into fundamentalism, and absolutely hated every part of the Western way of living, and their religion, Christianity. The social struggle of Pakistan between the very loud Islamists, and the silent moderates, has grown wider, and steadily out of control, in the past four decades within Pakistan. Pakistan has been under military dictatorship, for about 33 years of its existence, and the rest of the period, was supposed to have been under civilian leadership. In reality, even during their period of civilian leadership, their army, and the powerful spy agency, ISI, had acted as the ultimate controlling authorities, and have had considerable influence in running the country. None of their elected prime ministers have completed their full term, and the army had a role in their removal as well. There are two major political dynasties, that have controlled Pakistan, for more than half a century, namely, the Bhutto dynasty of Pakistan People's Party, from the Sindh province, and the Sharif dynasty of Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, from the powerful province of Punjab. There are about a dozen or more political parties with varying agenda, which also have played a support role during this period. By 2018, the Pakistani army, its people, and even the media, had become less and less enthusiastic about these two dynasties, and were looking for an alternative. Both the top parties, namely, the PPP, and PMLN, had plenty of corruption charges, and were believed to have transferred massive amount of money abroad, illegally. So, the idea of a new face in Pakistani government formation gained ground. The only real alternative political choice available was, the charismatic and eloquent, former cricket star, Imran Khan, who reached a demigod status, after winning the World Cup in 1992, as the cricket captain. Though he founded his own political party, Pakistan Tariq e Insof, or PTI, in 1996, he had gained acceptance as a political leader only since 2013. When the general election approached in 2018, Imran Khan had become a favorite of the Pakistani army. Imran Khan was popular with the youth, Pakistanis living abroad, and the religious Islamists, who believed Imran Khan stood up for their causes. What transpired next was a wide range of activities, that tilted the electoral playing field, very much in favor of Imran Khan's party, PTI. 
Top leaders of the PMLN were either prevented from contesting the elections, or imprisoned, and several top leaders of the other major party, PPP, switched their loyalties to PTI. It was widely believed, by independent observers and international agencies, that the Pakistani army was further involved, in ensuring that PTI will emerge as the single largest party, through blatant rigging. The opposition parties declared that the election results were fraud, and alleged massive corruption. Despite how Imran Khan came to power in Pakistan, there was widespread expectation that Imran Khan will deliver on his promise of getting rid of the endemic and pervasive corruption, provide employment to the masses, and improve the economy. His slogan was to create a new Pakistan, a changed, transparent Pakistan. Imran Khan failed as a prime minister, both domestically and internationally, with his misguided policies. The Pakistani economy has been on a downward trend since 2001. Imran Khan was not the chief architect of Pakistan's failures, but his policies hastened the process to a near crisis never seen before in Pakistani history. His populist measures came at a huge cost of increasing the debt and destroying Pakistan's core economy. The inflation skyrocketed, and the foreign exchange reserves were completely depleted, that is now at a two-month reserve. The International Monetary Fund had to bail out Pakistan multiple times, during Imran's tenure. Imran Khan also followed an anti-West, anti-India policy, at the behest of China. There was further social unrest in Pakistan, created through their debt-ridden BRI project, called China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC. He deliberately fueled fundamentalism in Pakistan, to broaden his core support group. However, the unrest that this group created, worsened the economic climate, and scared the foreign investors even more. In 2022, Imran Khan had fallen out of favor with the army, and suddenly his coalition partners withdrew support. Imran had been very undiplomatic, and had locked horns, with both the major opposition parties, PPP, and PMLN. This made the two bitter political rivals get closer together, in the hopes of removing Imran Khan from power. When PTI, the party led by Imran Khan fell below the majority line, the opposition parties joined ranks, and formed a coalition, leading to the end of Imran Khan's tenure as Prime Minister, in April 2022. Imran Khan seemed caught by surprise, but was extremely defiant. He threatened nationwide protests, and disrupt life in Pakistan, if he is removed from office, while his ouster appeared imminent. He openly blamed the United States, for pushing the army to replace him, with a friendlier government in Pakistan. He also vowed that he'll never accept the opposition dynasties, or corrupt thieves, as he called them, come into power in Pakistan. But, nobody understood the full magnitude of Imran Khan's threats, until he carried them out. Imran Khan's party workers, in the tens of thousands, organized violent protests in Islamabad, in May 2022, caused widespread chaos and destruction to property, brandished guns openly, and burnt tall trees, in what was the scenic area of the capital. Imran Khan further threatened a civil war, if his demands were not met. The army is usually called to quell such violent protests. The Pakistani army, known for its strict professionalism, up until the 1970s, had become heavily mixed with religious ideologies. Imran Khan's hardline Islamist policy had earned him strong support within the army, splitting the army, based on their loyalty to Imran, and a serious risk of civil war does remain, if the army is called to stop Imran. On the economic front, the IMF is unwilling to aid Pakistan, under the present political climate, and has also laid out conditions, to remove the populist policies of keeping the petrol and diesel prices low, through subsidies. The new Pakistani government under Shabazz Sharif has removed some of the subsidies, which is likely to result in steep inflation, and make him quite unpopular. Sharif had to comply with the removal of subsidies to get the IMF aid, that's so badly needed. Added to these, there is a scarcity of fuel, wheat, and other food supplies in Pakistan. One of the provinces, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, 
abbreviated as KP, which is ruled by Imran's party, PTI, is refusing to supply wheat flour at low prices, stipulated by the central government, leading to an open spat between the KP government and the Pakistani Prime Minister, Shabazz Sharif. The KP government has also been threatening to employ its police force against the Pakistani army if the PTI supporters are prevented to protest. If that doesn't look civil war, it's hard to imagine what will. The decades-long mismanagement, misgovernance, and corruption has brought the worst living condition in Pakistan currently. Imran Khan is like a woman scorned who has been carrying on with his selfish goals against the country's core interests. He has issued statements on splitting the country into three parts and had given a lot of other irresponsible and dangerous speeches about Pakistan's nuclear arsenal. In simple terms, his language and threats can be definitely called as conduct unbecoming for a national leader. It remains to be seen how Pakistan will handle this crisis. Let's look at what Pakistan can do to navigate these troubled waters and avoid a crisis. 1. Pakistan badly needs to form a unity government with all political parties involved, including PTI. Without a unity government, Imran Khan's supporters can and will cause huge harm to Pakistan and any effort put in by the government to make things better can easily be undone by them. 2. Pakistan needs the Western nations, mainly the United States, and their support from the IMF, World Bank, and other global institutions. They need to shed their excessive dependency on China, and stop China's interference in Pakistan's foreign policy. 3. Pakistan needs to build a better relationship with India, and dismantle the highly expensive and massive terrorism infrastructure it has created in trying to recruit, nurture, and train terrorists, with the sole intent of causing harm to India. Though this destructive policy of 40 years will be hard to undo, it needs to be done to free up the resources to infrastructure development and other constructive projects. 4. Pakistan needs to balance its relationship with China and America better, and do the same between Saudi Arabia and Turkey. 5. Pakistan needs to look at Afghanistan as a sovereign nation, than as a tool, and should stop using it as a ground for grooming international terrorists for strategic objectives. What if Pakistan doesn't do the right thing, but gets into a crisis? A crisis in Pakistan can have serious consequences to its people and the world at large. Being a nuclear armed power, it becomes imperative that the nuclear arsenals are safeguarded properly, so that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. The world may need to provide immediate humanitarian aid to prevent a catastrophe, but Pakistan will need to do structural reforms for a long-term solution. Thanks for watching.